Good afternoon, good afternoon. And today we are going to talk about trust your trust. And I need y'all to come on up in here and get these questions together for real estate and living trust. And I am joined this afternoon by, look, two of the baddest attorneys out here in these streets, in these Chicago streets. And that would be one, they're both my attorney. I'm just going to go on and claim both of them right now. And that would be my girl, Jules, right? Julia, uh, Mez, let's say Mezer, right? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yep. Say it. Okay, because I got to get it right. Yeah. And then my also my attorney, Gina Smith. What's going on, ladies? Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we're coming over here today and I'm going to tell I have to tell you all some of my business in order for this to resonate with you. And we're going to discuss one preserving your legacy, right? And ensuring that the person you want to get your stuff gets your stuff. Uh, and keeping your money in your pocket. And I'm going to actually go back to the 90s. I purchased my first building in 1994 from my grandfather. Now, even though the building was in my grandfather's name because the mortgage was in my grandfather's name, my mother had the good sense to put the property at the time. I remember hearing the words an uh, irrevocable land trust. Now, I don't know if that's the terminology today. I haven't heard that term in a long time. And what my mother had was that my grandfather took the mortgage, but the property was in a trust to my mother. And if something happened to my mother, the property went to me. And if something happened to me, the property would go back to my grandmother. And if something happened to my grandmother, the property went to my mother's sister. So what happened was my father's sister made a comment one day because this was her biological father and, and it was my mother's father-in-law. And she says, oh, that building will be mine. And my mother said a whole lot of things will be yours, but that building won't be one of them. So when my grandfather decided to sell me the building, he could not sell me the building without my mother signing off on the trust. I was 24, and in that moment, I realized just because your name is on the mortgage does not mean that you have the right to dispose of said property in the desire in which you <laughs> desire, okay? And so, Julia, I came to you a couple of years ago because my mother-in-law had passed away. Right. And uh, some people know that Stephen uh, is adopted by his father. Stephen's adopted father had four children before Stephen. My mother had her mother-in-law had her property in a trust as well. And she did this in the 70s because the only person she wanted to have her house, right, was Stephen. When she passed away, we came down to Chicago Trust with $450, a death certificate, and a current ID. And you all did whatever voodoo magic you do in the background. And oh. it was Stephen's property, right, to sell. Why should people have their property in a trust in states that allow it? Well, first and foremost, let's, let's, let's say this, right? First and foremost, estate planning for many people is a very uncomfortable conversation, right? Um, nobody, everyone is, you know, invincible. Nothing is ever going to happen to anybody ever, <laughs> period, in life, right? We're going to live until we are 5,000 years old. No one ever falls ill. There's never a pandemic that shuts down the world. Nothing like that ever happens. So there's no reason to ever have to discuss estate planning. And there's always more time to get it done. And there's always more time. We don't have to do it now. We'll do it next week. And then when next week comes, we'll do it next week. And then when the following week comes, just like our exercise programs, we'll just start next Monday. This week's already started and we haven't done it, right? And so, you know, I think especially what the past year has shown us, right, is that we should always be expecting the unexpected. Because had you told me a year ago that the world would shut down, 
and there would be a pandemic that would take millions of people's lives unexpectedly out of the blue, I would laugh. I would laugh at you. I would say that you were, have been watching too many movies, right? And clearly the world has shown us that we should consistently be expecting the unexpected. Now, estate planning conversations don't need to be difficult and they don't need to be complex, right? Especially if the people that you know we are speaking to, they don't have too many assets. So if a client's biggest asset is their real estate, then you know something like a simple estate plan, which is a living trust, is sufficient, right? And so all a land trust is, is a vehicle that holds real estate. And really, a land trust has three purposes. First purpose is privacy protection, right? So when we put our property into a land trust, our public, our information, the, the intimate details of our real estate transaction do not become a matter of public record. And most clients, when they buy homes, they don't realize that their transactions become a matter of public record, right? That if I type in Marquis's name, I'm gonna find out where she lives, what her mortgage is, how much she paid for that property. You know, if I wanna show up for your family barbecue, you'd be putting those ribs up on Facebook all the time. All I gotta do is your property side of the land trust, all I gotta do is put in your name. Let me say this, I'm gonna interrupt you. I went to HomeSnap yesterday and a girlfriend of mine, her house came up. Yep. It showed me, it, it is not her house, it's her mother's house. It showed me every last one of her sisters, her niece and her nephew who stayed at the house and said that they were a former occupant on HomeSnap. Now Whoa. keep going. It will, <laughs> it'll give you their cell phone numbers. It'll give you their ages. I mean, it will give you all of their information, right? And so in order to avoid that, in order to avoid that, we put our property into a land trust. So on a deed, instead of the home buyer saying Marquee or Julia Measure, it'll say the buyer is Chicago Title Land Trust number 12345. That way the owner of the property still remain, the beneficiary of the, is the beneficiary of the trust. They stay, still retain all legal rights and control to the property as they would if the property was in their own name. They still get all the homestead exemptions, senior citizen freeze, whatever right but in addition to all those other perks they also get privacy protection okay then the land trust is also an asset and liability protection tool it pr protects us from becoming uh, a target of frivolous litigation and then thirdly and really what we're talking about here is a land trust becomes a very affordable and easy estate planning tool so the way that a land trust is set up is there is the trustee, which is Chicago Title Land Trust Company, or if you live in Indiana, Indiana Land Trust Company. And then there's the beneficiary of the trust and the beneficiary is the homeowner. OK, it could be one person, it could be two people, it could be a corporation, it could be an LLC, doesn't matter. And then what the trust allows you to do is the trust allows you to name something called a contingent beneficiary. OK, and so what a contingent beneficiary is, is in the event that something should happen to the beneficiary. The property automatically passes to whoever is named as the contingent. Now, the contingent could be anybody, right? It could be your kids. If your kids are not are not of age yet, you could put language in there saying that there's a guardian until they are of age. It could be your best friend. It could be your next door neighbor. It could be your secret lover. I mean, it could be whoever you want it to be. There's no judgment, right? And so what the land trust allows you to do is it allows you to keep your real estate out of probate court, right? When I find out how much my probate attorney friends make, I realize that I've gone into the wrong area of practice in law, right? Because for probate attorneys, their initial fees are like $10,000. And that's for like seamless transactions. And probate cases are very rarely seamless transactions, right? And what they do is they tie up the property in court for could be years. And then, you know, I don't know about you, right? Well, I know about Marky. I know Marky works really hard. I know I'm positive Gina does as well. Um, I work really, really hard uh, for my money and my assets. And so, you know, in my opinion, I should be the only one deciding 
who my property goes to. I don't believe that the state of Illinois should have a, a say so in that, right? And so when your property is in a land trust, that a land trust is not contestable. And so I'll have clients say to me, well, you know, Julia, um, I have a will. And I don't, I don't have a land trust, but I have a will. And in the will, I said that my property is going to my best friend. And it's great. It's great. But several things happen with wills, right? First and foremost, most of my clients will have a will and not tell anyone they have a will. <laughs> Guess what? If we can't find your will, you don't have a will, right? Wills are not recorded documents. Number two, wills are definitely contestable on their face. So land trusts trump wills at all times. So land trusts are the easy and affordable estate planning tool for people that don't have a ton of assets and that their real estate is their biggest asset. Now, when people do have a ton of assets and they have a need for a living trust that, you know, Gina will talk about, right? Land trusts are still, exactly. <laughs> Trusts are still important. And the reason is this. And Gina will, I'm sure we'll get into it as well. But you know, when I set up a living trust, it says the Julia Measure Living Trust number one, two, three, four, five. Right? Now, when I see that somebody has a living trust, what that signifies to me is money, right? I see dollar signs. And so uh, I don't know if you know, but at the end of every year, Cranes comes out with the 50 top real estate transactions that happen in the Chicagoland area. Last year of the top 15, eight of them were in Chicago Title Land Trust. The other seven were either in a living trust or in the client's own name, right? So if I'm looking at this list and I see the Julia Measure Living Trust owns this property, I know a living trust signifies assets, I'm going to go and slip and fall on that property myself, right? Why? Because I know that when I sue these people and I get a judgment entered against them, they have assets for me to collect on, right? And so although we want to be very rich, I want to be very rich. I'm just gonna put that out there. I'm manifesting that, I'm saying it. The universe can hear me. I want to be very rich, okay? I don't want the general public to know because we live in a world of frivolous litigation and I ain't got that kind of time, right? So what we can then do is we make the living trust the beneficiary of the land trust because then we get the sophisticated estate planning of the living trust and we get the privacy protection of the land trust. So in today's day and age, because of social media, because we're so exposed, because of Google, because you know we have access to a tablet, an iPhone, an iPad, a laptop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's very, very, very important to be layering for maximum protection. So I want to say this, just so the world will know, I'm not as rich, even though I have a living trust. I'm planning for my riches, okay? Exactly. Um, so I have... We have a real estate trust. We have a living trust. Now, I'm going to tell you how we got to Gina. So maybe, I think it's three years. It might be four, three years now. My ex died suddenly from a massive heart attack. <clears throat> we were still friends at the time of his death. We still communicated. I knew verbally exactly how he wanted his estate to go, but he never put it in writing because he did not put it in writing they made a muck of his assets and his situation down to giving him a funeral because i'm pretty sure he didn't want all his women at the same place at the same time oh okay but no let's just we're gonna have this estate planning conversation no, let's, let's just talk let's, about it right I mean, okay keep it real, keep it real. Right. he I mean, didn't want all of us including me to lay eyes on certain people and to be in one room as mentally, everybody put the whole situation together. So I saw everything he worked for unravel in front of my face down to the fact they gave him a funeral and that's not what he ever wanted. With that being said, it encouraged me to make sure 
that I went at the age of 48 and put everything in writing exactly the way that I wanted it to be. Now, I'm also in a blended household. I came to my marriage with a child. What The way I set mine up is not the way you have to set yours up. I set <coughs> mine up with the intention that if something happens to Stephen, everything goes to me. And then if something happens to me, it is equally divided among my children. But in order to offset that, because I got to let people know the offset, I increased my assets and my insurance policy so that if something happens to me first, Stephen will receive the same amount of money from me as I would have received from him. I increased my assets to make sure that there could be a equal division of almost 33 percent between the people who I desire to have whatever it is that I have upon my death. So I am worth more dead than my husband is worth. Everything he has comes to me. Everything I have is split in thirds. So this is not, um, when you think about your estate planning, it's not one size fits all. You have to do what you feel comfortable with. What I, what I would not have felt comfortable with is for Skylar to not share equally in all of my hard work. That would not have ever said well with me. With that also being said, I've already prepaid for my cremation. I didn't know you earned interest off the thing, okay? The reason is that when people die, people take it upon themselves. So if you ever see a GoFundMe for Marky's funeral, it's a lie because my stuff is already prepaid, okay? Do not give to the GoFundMe for no Marky Lemons Ralph funeral ever in life because that ain't even my wishes. Let's put that out there on the Facebook right now. I prepaid for it because when it is prepaid for, the likelihood is no one is going to want to spend any of the money I'm leaving them to pay 10 times the cost to give me a funeral because that's what they desire in that moment. They're going to go to that prepaid cremation and be like, oh, <laughs> she just want, <laughs> look, she just wanted to be set on fire. Let's take care of that. And we're going to divide these ashes in thirds if that's what they desire to do. So, Gina, I came to you because we got a blended household. We got some unique, not unique, it's probably typical today, right, going on. Blended is very typical today. Blended. And so that leads to a whole bunch of problems. How did you get me an order? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, hi, everyone. I'm attorney Gina Smith. I'm happy to say that I'm a longtime friend of Marky, and it was an honor to work on her estate plan. Um, and so Marky was not the typical client in that she already knew where her quote unquote pain points were, the things that she needed to protect against. Like most people kind of just come and plop a bunch of information on me and I have to have a long conversation. So working with Marky wasn't so difficult. Um, what I do as an estate planning attorney is that I think about the entire life cycle of a family, not just what will happen after death. So typically my estate plans are going to include at least three documents. And that's going to be a living, uh, living trust with a pour over will, a power of attorney for health care and a power of attorney for property. Because what also happens now is that because of privacy laws and the fact that we're living longer and um, debilitating diseases such as Alzheimer's and dementia, autoimmune disorders are very common, a person may become physically or mentally incapacitated and unable to handle their affairs on their own. And so those power of attorney documents um, empower your trusted agents and they don't have to be a family member if you don't think your, your family can handle your your assets, then it shouldn't be to step in during your lifetime. And then um, after death, the other documents take control. And that what they do is they, we inventory your property. We say, these are all, this is all the stuff that I own. And this is how I want it to be distributed. And in your case, if someone has made pre-planned burial uh, plans and things like that, all those things, hold up your, hold up your body. <laughs> It's all in it's here. All in there. <laughs> and so 
And don't put it, don't put that binder in your safety deposit box. One copy's there. The documents, they won't be able to get to them. You, want to get you gave me two. <laughs> your trusted agents need to know where it is so that if you, again, if you just became really ill, Tomorrow for, you know, unforeseen accident or something like that. Stephen shouldn't have to worry about where those documents are. He should be able to grab his power of attorney for health care, power of attorney for property, talk to the health care providers freely because you have the privacy waivers and things like that. And if he needs to get to the bank, you know, to an account that you own by yourself, then that's what the power of attorney document allows him to do. So that's my approach for most families, but I have, you know, clients who are real estate investors and um, I, you know, explore whether or not the land trust is a useful tool for them for all the reasons that Jules already talked about. Um, I've started to recommend a certain business model for landlords to kind of ways to, again, provide layers of protection to limit liability. So we talk about all those sorts of things, but um, with regard to a blended family, it gets really complicated if you don't have um, these documents in place, because um, for instance, in the, the case of Skylar, if Stephen hadn't, hasn't legally adopted him, then Skylar doesn't have standing to inherit anything from him if, if Stephen died, what we call intestate. And that would be without a living will or a trust, because he's not legally the son of Stephen. And we know that Stephen would not want that, but that's what the court would, they would determine that his sole heirs would be you and, and your son, nobody else. So um, I think blended, like blended families are not the exception anymore. Or, and even if you're not a blended family, if you were never legally married, you may have children with more than one person. And how do you make sure those children are protected and get what they're entitled to? You can only do it through some good, thorough, thoughtful estate planning documents. When you uh, prepared our paperwork, I think the hardest discussion that we had, I'm, I know it was the hardest, and that was around health care. And to, to sign off and allow someone to make a decision about your health care. We sat at the table for a long time and we joked Did about really? it. Yeah, well, you were there, and then um, Troy oh, came yeah. over to notarize it, right? We signified, right. we like, I don't know. So I think right. that I our- I was like, I thought y'all were just joking. <laughs> no, no, oh, yeah, we were joking, but we were serious because we was like, oh, <laughs> but, we didn't expect that part of it. Like, we made that, that was a decision. Every other decision was made in advance. That one, we looking at each other like, oh, do I want to empower you to make the decision? You know, maybe you got a dip and you think she going to come over here and she going to do X, Y, Z, right? And so, yeah, I, I, yeah, it took a little minute there, Gina. I don't know, but I'm like dead serious. I don't you know, know like about this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you like um, so, uh, so with the healthcare it was very serious. And I think the way ours read, if, if the doctor makes that recommendation, Right. then we would go for it because I I took my mother off of life support because I was clear about her wishes. And she told me exactly how she wanted everything to go, which is why I also put it in there. But another reason why I put the cremation in there, and some people know that I'm joking. Some people think I'm joking. Some people know I'm dead serious. I could see Steven right now. I'm deceased. He going emotionally to a thing. Him telling y'all, Go get her good bra. I want to make sure they sitting up in the casket. Who <laughs> won't? Yeah, no, 100%, right? He want my good bra on me, right? But I was telling uh, Jules, we went to lunch last week, and I'm like, I had a long-term friend. When she passed away, she wore the same red fingernail polish for 20 years. She had blonde, straight hair. First of all, I don't know where this funeral parlor found this curly like little nappy wig to put on her head and I don't know what color red this was but I was telling Jules it was not clearly the Theon's number five because everybody remember Theon's red number five I said and I walked straight past the room she was in because she, nothing about her I could recognize from her fingernail polish to her wig right and I said mm, I would never want them to have me propped up 
propped up in the casket for people to pass judgment on how I look once I'm deceased. Let me take care of this right now. And, and, and took it, took care of it all. But here's the thing, this thing I don't have to worry about. Like I feel free. I, I haven't died yet. You know what I'm saying? But I'm clear what my children will get. And Gina jokes about this, but I'm putting everybody on allowance when I die. You have to be honest with yourself about your heirs. Or do they handle money well? I don't know why anybody leaves anyone large lump sums of money if they've never managed large lump sums of money. They will run through your money. They will not appreciate it. So I have everyone on a 10 plus year plan. Everybody get a look. I want to help you out a little bit every single month until your money runs out. But under no circumstances will you be able to take my money and go buy a car cash. Could you pay an expensive car note every month? Yes. But will you be able to go and buy cash and ball out of control? No, that's not the purpose. The purpose is I want you to feel my impact in your life for years to come. And so, Gina, what what when people do they even ask how they should do that? And what's the general yeah, I thought? I, ask, I, um, I make the suggestion where I think it's needed. And I mean, some people, like I have a client now has a really sophisticated portfolio, a financial um, portfolio. She knows her son. She knows her daughter. When we got to the point of saying, how do you want this to go to them? She knew good and dang on well that her daughter, her son would probably be more responsible than her daughter. But uh, we just set up a general, you know, a, a payout trust, a sub trust that basically provides for each of them. And of course, they're different ages. So they'll each have two different trust pots so that one isn't financially disadvantaged by the one that reaches 31st taking half. Like if we put everything in there together, the person who reached the daughter will reach 30 before the son. If she took half, well, he principal, his principal is lost and the interest that compound interest is diminished. So we have two separate pots. So one for him, one for her. They each get to take it up. They got a monthly allowance, much like much like uh, your family. And then they get when they reach like 30, they get to take, you know, the remaining balance out. So the beautiful thing about trust documents is that they're very fluid. They're very dynamic. They can really be personalized, you know, with great detail. More difficult to do that with a will. And I just want to say this about people. Not only do people not know where their wills are or the will is out of date, like a will has to go through probate court. So then you find yourself into that ex long, expensive, drawn out circumstance that Jules talked about. Um, and then regarding the living trust, I'm like very clear. Most of my clients, their biggest asset is their home. And so if I don't do anything else, I make sure that their trust gets, their um, home gets transferred in the trust. So they, again, can bypass um, probate court because you can't pass real estate in, um, in Illinois without going through the court, which is like crazy. You might have $1,000 in a bank account but have a house and you got to spend, you know, upwards of five to $10,000 in the courthouse just to be able to sell your house, just for the court to say, yes, you can sell it. Uh, the other thing, like, so Jules talked about, talked about the advantage of the land trust for giving you privacy and some asset protection and things like that. Living trust provides you that privacy as well. If you have a will, the first thing that your attorney has to do is file upon your death is file a copy of the will with the court file the case. And so all that is public record. Like, I, you know, Marky knows my dad's a retired judge. Back in the day, I would work in his office and I would go downtown to him and like pull files and go to recorded D's office and go through those big books with him when he was doing different transactions. Well, now it's all digital. Like I could go right now, type into, you know, a, a address into the recorder of D's and the stuff pops up. Same thing with the court files. You can search by name and say, whoo, look, Mark, you got all this, because you got to file an inventory with the court as well. So Living Trust provides you with that privacy. For my smaller, um, my clients that have, don't necessarily have a lot of financial interest, but have a home, I've started using the transfer on death instrument, because it's 
easy for them to understand. It's, um, has, works much like a land trust, except for, you, you know, you don't have to establish the trust um, in advance. But, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do things to provide tailored specific protection using those different documents. Can I think clients need to like understand, right? Like much like when we get uh, homeowners insurance, right? Or we get car insurance, like we get those things in the event that something should happen. Not because, you know, the minute we get it, something is going to happen. And so estate planning is, you know, much in the same. We handle our estate planning in the event that something should happen to us, everything is taken care of. Not because as soon as we have this estate planning conversation, we're going to die. That's not how that works, right? That one thing doesn't lead to the other. So much like we have homeowner's insurance, we have car insurance, estate planning is basically, you know, your insurance for your assets in your life. Yeah, and you don't want to be in a position of having to get a power of attorney for a bank account after the person becomes incapacitated because then you can't get it unless somebody's, you know, doing something shady with doing that power of attorney document. And, you know, so it is much like insurance. You want it before a life event happens rather than after it happens because then you're just hamstrung um, and, and in really difficult situations at a time that you don't want to have to deal with those you know those um if you're mourning the death of someone or someone's sick the last thing you want to be doing is chasing down so an attorney to do some power of attorney documents finding a notary all uh, those sorts of things like have them done beforehand and give yourself like mike marky said some peace of mind like that's that's my goal as well i want my clients once we finish the process to have some peace of mind and look, because we're having this conversation, I need to sit down and go back over these documents again, right? Because you you should review them as things change. Like I have more assets now than I had get crazy before the pandemic. Now, someone's asking a question, who manages the payouts of my trust? I want to say, didn't we put uh, uh, Northern Trust down? I think. I do it. Yes, I had to think about it. So you can have, you can name an individual or you could name a corporate trustee. In your instance, you felt like a corporate trustee was more appropriate because again, the sophistication of your portfolio and things like that. And maybe you just didn't have a family member that you trusted, to, you know, so um, <laughs> that, and that's real. Like you said, like you can't entrust someone to handle these documents or to handle, and you're, you are unique in that you have a miracle trust for you and Steven's asset. And then we did that separate trust so that you could have your final say <laughs> on their monthly allowance. Like there was no way to accomplish that within the marital trust. So you actually have two separate trust documents. Yeah, because everybody, including Stephen, is getting a, a a monthly allowance. I said, I want to be nice, but mm -mm, y'all won't be making a muck. I can see my, I'm telling you, my ashes would literally shift. And the reason I picked uh, Northern Trust is because I think my husband makes great sound decisions, but I also know that he's emotional. With him being emotional, I don't want him to have to make a decision in that moment. So I made the decision for him as they are either marital assets or my assets. And so I felt very comfortable. Here's what's the joy of this. We've not had one argument about nothing that is in this trust once we completed the trust, the children know exactly what they're getting. As I explained to Austin, who is 14 now, I said, if something happens to us, your brother will take care of you. And we have a list of people. I said, but don't ever allow anyone to make you feel like you are a burden because you come with your own money and they're going to have good money to take care of you every single month. So I've had that conversation with Austin because you have some children, you know, they're getting all this money per month for the kid and want the kid to act like they're a burden. No, sweetheart. But by the time you get your Social Security uh, pension and everything else, right, and the money, you ain't never going to be a burden on nobody. Make them treat you good because you got your own money. So <laughs> that's just, that's how I operate only based on things that I've seen in the past, which dictated uh, the decisions that we made and also wanting to be fair and understanding the dynamics of, uh, of a blended family. So people are telling us, Ernie Brown, my good friend, hey, Ernie, um, great to talk about estate planning. We don't talk about it enough. And I'm gonna say this just for the women. 
you move into a man's house, you've been in that house for 20 years, shacked up with him, that don't mean that's your house, okay? And I see it happen all the time where people living with people, or even let me say this, they living with people, they could be married, but he could have been married before. And, and look, the other, he, he, this is the true story. <laughs> they laid up together. He is newly married. However, he bought the house with the ex-wife. Okay. If something happens to him, the new wife is living in the ex-wife's house, contingent upon how they took trust. I mean, took title. And it's very real that the ex-wife can come and essentially put the new wife out. And so we see these situations, especially with shacking and contingent upon common law, just because you hanging out there and paying the bills does not mean that you have the right to ownership. And it, it's amazing how many times people reach out. Well, my mama been with him for 20 years. Yeah, and <laughs> that no, means not absolutely not nothing. nothing. You know, I, I recently did that video referring to uh, DMX's fiance. He wanted to make a claim for a common law wife. And the judge was like, eh, you we don't, don't have no rights. Go somewhere. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, ladies, I want to thank you. First of all, uh, J J you know what? We need some. They can reach out. We have Attorney Gina Smith for all of your estate planning needs. We also have Attorney Julia. We call her Jules because she be dropping them jewels. Uh -huh. Measure uh, with Chicago Title Trust. Chicago Title Trust actually uh, is where my real estate trust is. And then my living trust is, I think the beneficiary, if that's how I set up, right? And uh, Gina Smith set mine up. So as you well know, I only share with you the people that I use. And I knew that I was going to probably have to have some dialogue today that normally we don't have. But my goal is to always encourage us to change, to do better. The last thing you want is a probate attorney eating away at the equity of the asset that was left for you. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't plan on a probate attorney ever having access to mine and or my children, because whenever Skyler gets his first property, rest assured, it's going to be in a trust, right? Because I don't want it to happen to me and I don't want it to happen to my children. And more importantly, I don't want it to happen to you. Because if we were to go back and look at state after state where Black wealth has been eroded, it is because of how they held title in those states. You want to be very clear to understand the rules and regulations in your state. Some of the terminology we use might be Illinois specific, but you want to have these tough conversations now. Set your assets up to go the way that you desire for them to go and have a conversation. Well, that's it, the biggest mistake that we make as a community is that we just don't talk about it. And some of us don't talk about it because we don't know any better or don't have the knowledge. But others of us just fall into the trap that Jules mentioned is that, oh, you know, I got time or I'm going to get around to it. Or, or, or the biggest one is I'm not rich, so I don't need a plan. That's the biggest thing. Well, if you own a house, you do not want your equity or what your, your family should receive to be eaten up by having to go through the probate, probate court. And, you know, like I'm, I have horror stories around that. I settling of the state of a friend who's selling his father's building who had a, a really well done living trust and property was deeded into the trust. Easy peasy, as opposed to a family that owned a property through several generations and never secured title for it you know, the last heir in the property, a mess. So um, just a little bit of foresight can save you a lot of pain and suffering. Someone has a great question. How do you set it up if you are between two states? Do you set state, do you set it up based on the state that you reside in the longest as your primary state? I would recommend um, so if there's a, if it's a living trust, you can account for the property in multiple states in that one trust document. It becomes more complicated with the will. Another reason to have a will, but yeah, you should if you're if one of those states is your primary residence, then that's where you should do the documents. 
And then again, if you hold, if you're holding, if you're holding property in multiple states, you really need a living trust because otherwise you find yourself dealing with three different probate courts. If you have properties in three different states, because eating away Illinois, at the equity, <laughs> Illinois can't take jurisdiction over your Florida property can't take jurisdiction over your North Carolina property. So you're dealing with all the courts in those three different states. Whereas if you transfer the properties into your living trust, then your administrator, your successor has the authority to deal with each of those outside of the court. And we're very lucky because, um, you know, for land, land trusts are state specific. So not, not all 50 states recognize land trusts. There's only actually six states in all of the United States that recognizes land trusts. Illinois happens to be one of those states. Indiana happens to be one of those states. So we're very lucky because we're one of the few states that recognize land trust and that there's actual law, you know, so we're one of the few states that has that estate planning tool and that privacy protection tool. So we're, we're very lucky to have that. Well, I want to thank Jules and Gina for getting me together. I'm able to sleep very well. I sleep like a baby. And if you are looking to establish your living trust, I want you to reach out to attorney Gina Smith. And if you are looking and likely, and let me say this, you're going to have to set up your real estate trust. I use Chicago Title Trust. Um, actually, look, that's where all of my real estate trusts have been held um, because it's a seamless process and because of their recognition in our marketplace. So I want to thank you, ladies, everybody, make sure you reach out to them, have a conversation so that you can preserve your legacy. Thank you, guys. Thank have you a good day. Everyone have a great day. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.